Coming up on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. Where we started was not to say, this is a marketplace. So you come here, you put data to sell, and you, and you go buy data. What we're trying to do is take a, I hope, pragmatic and maybe incremental approach to this to say, everybody should be able to set up their own digital marketplace for data, but almost nobody realizes that they should, that they will want to, and that it's even possible. Using external data in addition to your internal data is strategic. Besides public microservices, business systems, and IoT products, an emerging source of external data is the data mart, otherwise known as the data marketplace or data exchange. That is, places where you can buy and sell data on the open market. But should you sell your data? And are there any other options? In this episode of the IoT Business Show, I speak with Tim Panagas about setting up your own data mart and the inherent value of doing so, even if you don't plan to sell anything at all. All this and more on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. The people, the business, and the technology of the next generation internet. This is the IoT Inc. Business Show. And now, here's your host, Bruce Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the IoT Inc. Business Show. This show is made possible by sales of my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, and the IoT Inc. Certified IoT Professional, or ICIP, online training and certification program. Become a certified IoT professional by completing the program's three courses, ICIP Technology, ICIP Business, and ICIP Strategy and Digital Transformation. Details of which can be found at www.iot-inc.com. That's www.iot-inc.com. With me today on the IoT Show is Tim Panagus. Tim is the Chief Technology Officer at Microshare.io, where he manages product development and tech strategy. He has a background in artificial intelligence, and his most recent endeavor is to bring enterprise-grade data management solutions to the IoT space. Tim, welcome to the show. Good morning, Bruce. Thanks for having me. So what type of AI experience do you have? Well, I started some 25 years ago in uh, artificial intelligence. And at the time, the technology had advanced to the point where you had expert systems. Um, That was the the, the AI of the day. And uh, I was quite interested in that coming out of uh, school with a computer science degree. And so I decided I would go find a job related to that and and found a uh, company in Cambridge, Massachusetts that was commercializing expert system AI, one of the very few that survived. And they were, you know, basically writing software for banks. So it got pretty practical uh, right away, um, which appealed to me. It was both kind of cutting edge technology but it was put to a real purpose, which uh, as an engineer, that's where my heart lives. <laughs> now, I don't know. Do you follow chatbots at all? And uh, it seems like there's a lot of parallels with chatbots and uh, expert systems. It seems like they're making a bit of a resurgence. For sure. So, you know, even in that day, there was a fair amount of work applying expert systems to uh, a vocal uh, responses. And, you know, we just called them IVRs, right? Interactive voice response units, right. which are the, you know, the things you interact with when you call a company on the phone. M- m- many people, I think, would just dismiss that and not think about it. But, you know, 25 years ago, when those hit the hit the scene for the first time, um, even very simple uh, interaction via voice was uh, was really rocket science. And to see how far it's come to the point where, uh, distinguishing who's the human in one of these interactions is uh, is blurry. Certainly, 25 years ago, you knew you were talking to a to a robot, but um, it's been sort of a continuous line of improvement on that on that track for the for the last 20 years, for sure. Yeah, I think. Well, yeah, like you say, definitely the quality of the 
I guess the text to voice has, mm -hmm. has really improved and then the natural language understanding so that they yeah. know what to trigger. And behind the scenes, yeah. it may still be something as well, I'm not going to call it simple, but structured like an expert system. But I yeah. guess it's just that interface to the different leaf nodes or the nodes in that system that have, I think that's what's that's most what mostly what's changed. But be under the hood, I kind of looked a little bit at the I can't remember the name of it. It's the it's the Amazon um, NLP or NLU library. Mm -hmm. And it looked a lot like an expert system to me, but I'm not really yeah. qualified to say otherwise. Well, you know, I think the thing that's interesting about expert systems is it may be the first commercialized AI because in some ways it appealed to a human uh, need that, yes, I want the system to be intelligent, but I also want to be able to predict what it might say. Um, right. And so that's the realm of expert systems, right, is because I de de essentially design the conversation, even though I don't necessarily know how it will flow, I can kind of mandate uh, the realm in which it will traverse, right, the, the tree of possible responses. Mm -hmm. And um, and in business, that's still pretty important to people, right? They want an intuition about what their systems are going to do. And the further we get in AI, the harder that becomes to pin down. And frankly, the more business people are becoming uncomfortable uh, with the potential that yeah. they don't know how or why uh, their AI might uh, react. Yeah. And, you know, you're getting into the topic of what is it called? Explainable AI and, right. and uh, the government's also the other the other player in this in this situation. Certain regulatory issues are, you know, surround being able to explain AI. And, and I guess I never really got it because even mm -hmm. in the and maybe you can shed some light on this, but. Yeah, you know, for the whole for the for the traditional classes of AI and, and for this discussion, we'll put aside expert systems. We'll talk about machine learning and yeah. you know th that those that set of algorithms. Okay, they're they're totally explainable. Then of course, then we get to the to the to the deep learning, and we start looking at those. Then yeah, they're they're big. But they're still explainable. Right? You know, there's nothing magic going on in there, right? I mean, it's just there's a lot going on in there. And if you maybe the maybe the point is you can't explain it in a in a way that's interpretable in a short amount of time or I don't know. But, you know, you could you no, could write right, debug it. You know what I mean? Like you could just lay sure. out the whole thing, all the calculations that happen. But interpreting what those calculations, they're not secret, but they're just a That's lot right. of them. Uh, what do you think? Uh, no, I think you're exactly right, Bruce. And, you know, I think if you apply that same logic, there's n there's nothing unexplainable about the way the human mind works. <laughs> if you've got the computational power, the attention and the uh, savvy to understand what, how the neurons are firing, right? So it's almost like it's it's not explainable AI we want. It's understandable AI, which frankly is um, is a pretty low bar to hit. And, right. you know, I think that's part of the comfort level that people need to get over because we're well beyond the realm of understandable AI, even with, you know, current machine learning. And, and 10 years ago, I think we were there hmm. with more, the more complex um uh, expert systems as well is yeah just because it could be explained doesn't mean you can understand it right but it's that understanding that grants comfort right um, yeah. yeah but i think some of this is generational as well right uh where people who have grown up uh, interacting with uh these chat bots that are indistinguishable from humans will feel differently i think about their relationship and comfort level with them rightly or wrongly uh, mm -hmm. And I think as that cultural phenomena continues, um, yeah, I think the the degree to which it becomes explainable uh, will increase, of course. I think the depth and sophistication of understanding will increase yeah. and the comfort level with maybe not really getting the fuzzy side of it uh, will increase. And I think that's just the natural path of technology adoption. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And, and I think also. We'll be able to apply AI to explain the AI, right? Right, the fuzzy parts, exactly. <laughs> and you know, and then uh, so effectively, what we're doing there is creating software to explain the software that software created, which is kind yeah. of uh, you know, which can be a little mind-boggling once you start nest that a <laughs> start nesting that a little For bit sure. further. Well, it's, it's it's always the question of who watches the watchers. 
<laughs> and if watching uh, makes a difference or not. But uh, indeed, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, we we know a little bit about you from an, an AI perspective, but why don't you give us a little bit broader sense of your experience, and in particular with with our, uh, the Internet of Things? Sure. So, uh, I spent the first twenty years of my career really kind of working in. Um, well-heeled industries, so people who could afford to uh, fund and deploy what at the time were kind of um, science project mm. uh, kind of uh, IT deployments, right? So it was started in banking and went into insurance uh, and, and lately into healthcare. Right, you went where and the money is and basically. <laughs> where the money is and, and where the use cases are yeah. so uh, clearly uh, generative of ROI that they make sense for investment, right? And I think that's what it, what it really matters. And that's mm -hmm. where you always see the early adoption of a cutting edge technology is, is in those places where, hey, if you could solve this problem, there's very clear return for the business. Um, so that's where AI, you know, I think naturally found a growing up place. And that commercial step as an engineer, as I said, I think is super important mm -hmm. because if you don't pull it out of the lab, um, you never really develop the technology to a practical point where it's solving, you know, real human, real world kind of problems. Um, so even though I wouldn't have envisioned my 17 year old self didn't envision building banking software uh, for sure, but it, it was a good place to really kind of hone that skills and explore the use cases and frankly, just understand the real world of enterprise computing, which is, you know, still where most of the uh, really interesting data lives. Mm. And so what I wanted to do uh, was, one, stop writing banking software, ideally, and, and, take, <laughs> and take some of these, um, these project insights, this technology insights, and try to democratize it a little bit. And, and even if it's not bringing it uh, to the common man exactly, at least bringing it down market so that you know, small and mid-sized businesses could take advantage of what had been really only the purview of, of you know, very large enterprises. Mm. Um, because the world of cloud and the world of open source really does make it possible to assemble these things in a way that make them, you know, practically applicable. Because I think the promise of improved productivity and improved human life as a result of that um, really is uh, compelling. And so that's what I wanted to do. Naturally, uh, bringing this sort of high end AI uh, leads you very naturally into the problem of data management. Yes, because I think as you as you practice as you practice these arts, you realize that you know it's it's rarely the uh, core technology itself, but the task of scrubbing, finding, scrubbing, managing the data that these things eat yeah. and generate uh, becomes yeah. the primary problem. Yeah, yeah, and specifically, you know, the, the you know, there's been a few AI winters, and we're definitely at an AI summer now. And Absolutely. what's shining most of the light is are these deep neural networks. And speaking of data, you know, they 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 require probably orders of magnitude more data than you know what was required before. Absolutely. You know, and I, and I and I see that you know it's kind of funny when you're talking about getting out of the lab and going in the real world. I could almost apply those words to where we are now. I, yeah. I mean, if you know what I mean, it's just maybe just applying it to a more sophisticated AI because I'm seeing the industry. You know, when I when I dig into it more myself, people are reading papers. You know, people mm -hmm. are implementing in, uh, in in algorithms the papers that they read, and that was very much like it was when I started my career myself in computer graphics, where mm -hmm. where we would be reading the papers and then we'd be implementing it, and so we're right on the edge, right, right on that edge right. of research, and then and then you know these are for companies like Silicon Graphics and, right. and the software companies that that ran on them, and it seems like we're almost there. We're almost in that same place, but then when you say it, you were also in that same place. So it, I don't know. It's kind of repeating itself. Well, there's, there, there, there's always a cutting edge, or, or at least there should always right. be a cutting edge, yeah. right? So there's there's always a boundary in which someone is interested in commercializing the academic thought and making it applicable. But you know, I think the degree to which that happens varies whether it's a winter or a summer, as you said, right? So the fact we're in uh, a summer for AI 
you know, the question is, will fall come inevitably or mm -hmm. are we in a new era where it's just such a part of our natural life that we'll never again see uh, see the shadow fall? But regardless of that, I think there's always somebody looking to push the boundary and there is always someone in an engineering or entrepreneurial context looking to figure out, all right, how can we take these insights out of the lab and apply them? I was um, had the good fortune to speak uh, at a conference in Europe this summer hmm. where there were 35 uh, doctoral candidates and uh, postdocs, recent postdocs, uh, uh, attending and presenting their work. Mm -hmm. And most of it was oriented to some flavor of machine learning. Yeah. Uh, it happened to be a conference about automotive uh, data. But uh, almost everybody had had something to do with deep learning, machine learning, emotive uh, computing, that whole area. What was intriguing was that as you listened to uh, very bright people, very much on the cutting edge, yeah. and you kind of double tapped on their research, some of the things they've been working on, some of them for, for five years uh, for the postdocs, when you ask them how they could improve their research or, or what it would be like to make it easier for them to push the boundaries, almost, almost consistently, the answer was, actually, I, I need real data. Yeah. And what was disturbing was many of them spent the first two years looking for real data to apply, not finding it, and another year figuring out how to simulate data. <laughs> right. <laughs> then yet another year training algorithms against simulated data. Right. And, you know, that just underscored for me that these papers are great and they're generating algorithms, but you have to trace back to what was used to feed and build those algorithms. And if that, you know, fundamental bedrock of information was questionable, you know, are we doing the best we can with these bright minds who are absolutely trying to shine a light and and uh, expand what we're getting out of this AI <laughs> summer? And, yeah. and that speaks to what I think is really important about, you know, data management, data mart. Uh, it's all about, gee, we got to get that raw natural resource refined to the level where it's it's consumable uh, in the cutting edge and, and the um, the earning edge. Right. As well. Yeah. No. And that's that's definitely true. And you can see what's, what, you know, in my view, and I'm just starting to embrace this term because I kind of repelled from it for a long time, but this digital transformation. Right. But in my view, the digital transformation is a transformation of of uh, physically based companies into the digital realm. Now, now, if you look at the biggest players in AI today, those being the Googles, the Facebooks, the Bandai, the all these companies are they live in and they have these these major volumes of data. So this takes us to IoT and this kind of you know closes the loop to a certain extent because these postdocs and these PhDs, uh, if they want data, well go to IoT, you know, because right. because you can set up a lot of sensors and all of a sudden now you've got time series, you got you know structured data, you got unstructured, yeah. you got a lot of data and this is what's going to, you know, the data part of it which is, you know, very important that's why I wanted to speak with you today, but you are now going to have this data. You don't need to simulate it. You don't need to, you know, put in, uh, recreate it. Um, you don't have to work with algorithms that don't need it. You are going to have this data, but that takes us to the point of, you know, our conversation is, like you said, and we're sort of getting there, is you need to, <clears throat> I think there's definitely the refinement, but there's the whole structuring of it, which is, you know, which yeah. is, I think, um, what you know what you're doing so maybe maybe give us a con give us a give us a broad overview and then dig in a little bit to this concept of a data mart and by the way i like data mart i like it better than exchange or or yeah. uh, marketplace but and maybe you can maybe you can also answer before you answer before you take us down that journey why did you guys choose data mart because i haven't seen anyone else using it but i like it well uh i'd have to go flip through some books but you know i think it was snow crash um, oh really are you serious <laughs> yeah. that's one of my favorites i didn't realize it's in there? Of course. I, I believe it is. Um, oh, it's um, okay. it's either Gibson That's or Stevenson. Okay. Uh, used yeah, the, used the, uh, the phrase data mart. 
Um, uh. and, and in that context was meant to describe these, you know, uh, experiential virtual reality, um, uh, edifices, right. Uh, right. in that virtual world right. of the future that they were describing in that cyberpunk, uh, sci-fi, um, and, That's um, why I like it so you know, much. that definitely influenced, uh, influenced <laughs> my thinking and, um, and, and my verbiage, I suppose as well. Okay. Um, I, I think, um, a marketplace is something very structured. A mart is, is a place you might buy underwear. Right. Uh, if you need it, you know, and maybe a condom and maybe, uh, and maybe some milk when you're at it, you know, correct. it's kind of got it all. Correct. So, you know, a data mart, uh, I think, ultimately, in my mind, shouldn't be something that is only the purview of a small, rarefied few consumers. It should mm. be a place where um, everyone can come to sh- shop for common goods, some of them large capital goods, some of them complicated and requiring research, and others impulse buys. And I think if you look at the world of data, we've got all of that kind of variety. You've got impulse buys in terms of uh, Facebook posts or YouTube (laughs) videos. You've got complex uh, purchases of petabytes of of data sets used to train uh, deep learning, right? And everything in between. Mm. And so what I wanted to do when we set out to commercialize this uh, technology but democratize uh, this technology was was to say, look, I don't want to presume that it works only for one kind of data and therefore presume that the data mart would be specialized to, you know, trivial data or super complex data. I wanted to have something that was general purpose because I think, you know, that's the modern world, uh, I think, should work that way. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I think also data mart and maybe I'm reading too much into it. Mm-hmm also implies something that can be small and it could be run that's by, you know, by a smaller, let's say, company as opposed to having to be something that's this massive undertaking like an exchange, you know, that, or like that's a right. marketplace. And so I kind of like, I mean, again, maybe I'm reading into it, but I kind of like that, that kind no, of I view think, as well. I, I think you hit the nail on the head for that, right? Um, you know, and as big exchanges uh, of our modern world, like Amazon.com, for instance, um, followed more of the eBay model where, yeah, we've got a big warehouse full of stuff, but we're also going to open up a platform for mom and pop suppliers mm-hmm. to market their wares in, in, in a essentially even playing field. I think that's exactly how data should be thought of as well, um, because ultimately, as I look forward at what what are humans' role increasingly in a digital world, um, more and more we're going to be consumers and creators of information. Um, and we are today. It's just that um, I think people are only just waking up to the degree to which this is true and what it implies to their lives and what it implies to the value of Silicon Valley uh, stock market prices. <laughs> um, but as you run that forward, I think the ability to put my personal data up on a data mart and allow people to bid for it and purchase it or or otherwise share it in ways that comply with my intent as a private individual. Hmm. Well, I think that becomes more and more important and um, and the and the and the public becomes more and more aware. And I think that's where things like GDPR um, are birthed from that notion. Yeah. And that's raising, you know, that's just raising the data IQ of everybody, you know, that's starting right. with with businesses. But it's, you know, it's percolating. I I was on my book tour in Europe last summer and it was amazing that it was on the lips of everybody. Now, I wasn't mm-hmm. talking to Joe Blow on the street, but it is having that effect. You know, that data IQ is going up for everybody. And and I and I, you know, I can also see people having their own data marts. Yeah, right. potentially, you know, right. where, right. where, yeah, you go somewhere and you, and maybe you put your, your data you know, for sale there, but you could also have your data where people come to you, uh, potentially. Right. And then I also like the concept, you know, of the platform. And one of the things I recently understood from Amazon, from an Amazon perspective and why they could 
offer their services to these small mom and pop shops and literally like one person shops is that when they develop their uh, system, they developed it as a platform. And what that meant is everything was built with a, with an external, with an API that mm-hmm. could be externally facing. Right. Right. So they, they built it with a, so they built a product that they that they built their product on and then they then they could expose that API. And I think we'll, we'll probably get into that, um, in a few moments, but before that, I want to kind of, okay, so we're, we're, we're data marts. Okay. We're kind of squinting our eyes, place where you get data, buy data, but why are they needed? What's the, you know, why do we need data marts and we'll extend it to exchanges and, and marketplaces? Right. Well, I think fundamentally, you are correct in your assertion that IoT makes it possible to know essentially everything about the world and, and not to be too grandiose, but probably the universe at the end of the day. That we know, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and the problem is and the problem will be that it becomes questionable whether you're allowed to know. So it becomes possible to know, and therefore mm-hmm. people are curious about it. And those that are uh, potentially immoral or amoral mm-hmm. um, will take that knowledge and never look back. And I think that's part of the regulatory uh, backlash that we're seeing today. But if you get beyond that and say uh, society has adopted a cultural norm that says privacy is of the utmost, and this data about the world, about my behavior, about uh, the spaces I might inhabit – are also part of that uh, human right of privacy. As the culture adopts that, they're also going to need to develop more sophisticated awareness about how to manage that while still doing business. You know, I think the the GDPR pendulum has swung very far to the mm-hmm. other side of all data is free to no data is available. Right. And, you know, that's going to be also an untenable position. Uh, It's not good for society, I believe. And it's always going to create an incentive for uh, secret and a moral accumulation and exploitation of a resource um, that has, you know, something that most resources in the world don't have, which is zero marginal cost. Um, It's very hard to know when someone has stolen your data because they don't deprive you of it. (laughs) Like they would if they stole gold or they stole your car. You know, your car is missing when it gets stolen. Uh, Data, not so. Right. Kind of like software. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. You know, and and then piracy and some people, you know, from a moral perspective, they kind of use that argument and they go, well, we're not really taking it from anyone. We're just taking a copy of it. Right. Right. And and regardless of how you feel about that with software, it is the sort of output intellectual rights as you play that forward and say, well, what are the intellectual products of um, a music producer or a sure. television star or a Instagram celebrity or a, you know, random uh, parent posting pictures of their children as you play that thread through You know, ultimately, we're talking about the contributions of content, knowledge, data of everyone, of various levels of sophistication in different realms. And why should we have different laws, different regulations, different platforms to manage all that different data? Because it actually isn't different. It's all Mm. it's all of a piece. Right. It all is me sharing something that um, if I had an intuition you were misusing I would be uh, I would be offended by I would be uh, fearful of I would be um, outraged by. Right. Uh, So that's, I think, the thread. And as long as you would say that data consumer would react negatively if they thought it was being misused or, in other words, if their intent for sharing were being misinterpreted or or um, or mistreated, then. Hey, we have we got to have a better way to deal with that, and it can't be all the way to no data is shared ever. Yeah, um, yeah and so yeah. that's really the realm in which I wanted to play is, you know, presume that data is meant to be shared because I think there's a greater good in that, and I think humans naturally want to, but at the same time we have this instinctual uh, revulsion for things that don't respect or understand our intent, and right. so. That mix, I think, is really where the the forefront is about about data privacy, data governance. Yeah. And I think the other aspect uh, where the value is added is in, you know, just the the structure and and adding structure to it. And sure. But I agree with you. I think that this pendulum, we're we're witnessing the pendulum probably maybe it hasn't reached the extreme, but I also think of it temporally and 
And when I look at how my children, now they're older now, um, you know, they're late teens and one is early, well, 21. Mm. But the way they look at data is very different than the way I look at data. And I'm not going to say they don't care about it, but they've kind of adapted to it. And they, they, well, it doesn't seem like they care as much. And the GDPR is being written by folks like us. Right. Over time, it's going to be folks like my kids that are going to be running the show and making these laws. And so I think that, too, will, you know, as as the, you know, as a society kind of um, just sort of comes to terms with it and adapts to adapts to this, it'll I think that pendulum will go the other way. We'll start swinging the other way. But in but in either case, it. You know, how whichever wherever that pendulum is, there still needs to be a logical way of holding this uh, these bits, you know, and right. and this, and we're going to call it, let's call it intellectual property, too, right. um, because it's going to be owned by by somebody. And so that's, you know, that's obviously another place of why you need these data marts is to mm-hmm. structure it in a way that they can be used. And then, OK, and then whatever the regulation is, then that, that tells us how we access it. But you do need this. You do need the structure, and and you know you use the the term earlier about um, oil, and it's interesting because you know I've been kind of thinking about that, and and I'm in, and and I and, and I'm not sure now that I that I buy into data is the new oil. I think right. data is the new refined oil, maybe yeah. because oil is a commodity. If you want data to be a commodity. Um, it's called fung fungility, I think it is. I'm gonna, uh, fungibility. Fungus, fungibility. That's it. Yeah. So for something to be a commodity, mm-hmm. there has to be some sort of standardization. So that like gold, you could take gold from this vendor and gold from this vendor, bring them together and use them. Or you could take minerals. You could, and the same thing has to happen if you want data to be a commodity like oil. Mm-hmm. Then this goes to my structure. You know, that's right. a long way. Right. I'm, kind of taking us to the structure that you need to have data that's interoperable uh, that that you know it's well so what are you doing you know with the data and i guess i'm kind of implying metadata i'm implying <laughs> cleaning the data normalizing the data yeah. but what are you doing if anything are there tools uh, that that yeah. that provide this type of structure so in fact it can be a commodity so it can be you know kind of traded like oil yeah i think you're bringing it back down to the practical uh you know, feet on the ground kind of view of what it's like to want to operate on data uh, Mm. today. I think where we're headed, just to make it explicit, is a world where we have meta AI that worries about restructuring data and does that for us. Okay. So I believe that, you know, our future is headed to that spot where the input structure doesn't matter anymore, but I will grant you that for the next five years, uh, maybe nothing else matters <laughs> because, right. you know, to your point, uh, ultimately it's the refinement of that. And I, and I tend to use the words data and information in a way to to uh, to kind of differentiate between of that. Of course. I, mean, I think of data as the raw material and information yes. as being contextualized, right? Yes. So it's so yes, rendered useful in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, but... To your point, from my perspective, being able to create some um, easy definitions uh, that people can target, particularly with IoT sensors, right? Uh, This is an area where most of the sensor readings that are collected by uh, IoT devices are pretty consistent. You know, at the moment, there's only so many things we can measure about the world. Um, even though there are an uh, infinite number of ways to take those simple sensor readings and render them into uh, indistinguishable, compacted, and 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 uh, compressed formats. But we know what they, they are. I mean, we know what they are, and we know what they're intended to measure, even if they're measuring things that are also uh, uh, byproducts, which I think are, are also equally interesting. Um, so what we have done is created something that I call a data domain module, which is a mouse full, uh, mm-hmm. kind of techie. I don't know what uh, what the marketing world will come to call those, but essentially it's a, uh, it's a domain-based data model, a simple domain-based data model that becomes the target 
for the decryption, unpacking of device data of a particular use case or particular domain, let's say a healthy home domain, right? Sensing VOC levels and humidity and temperature. Mm -hmm. Um, If we have a simple target for those that when the data ends up in the data mart, it, it has this simple structure that's annotated in a rich way, by the way, I think there's, there will always be real need for rich annotation yes. uh, that will make the data discoverable. It'll make the data fungible. Um, and what that really means in the short term is that people who develop apps or analytics um, around a particular data format can then take that asset and apply it in a different domain or in the same domain, but a different company or, or different problem set, different geography without having to go through all the fundamental you know, data scrubbing and all that stuff. So I think it creates more velocity uh, of that activity of, of, of generating apps people use to view data, uh, machine learning and analytics. And that Velocity will increase the uh, decrease the cost to adopt. As you decrease the cost to adopt, I think more people will engage, take risks because the risks are lower. Mm-hmm. You know, I think this is a virtuous cycle of you know making it more accessible creates more opportunity for people to generate and consume data. More generation consuming data generates more power for the data market. And more power in the data market, you know, begins to spiral up this awareness mm. of value and exchange. Um, and at, but to go back to the basics, yeah, that that common data format is is fundamental to that because if we all have our own data, and it takes a data scientist a month to scrub uh, a gigabyte of information about uh, my facilities management uh, in <laughs> IoT, that's yeah. There's too much friction in that, right? Yeah, yeah. There's too much friction, and and so your your domain-based data model mm. is this effectively is this effectively just uh, to a certain extent a vocabulary that you use for that data f- to make it discoverable, to make it uh, fungible? It, it is. It is. is. Have you have you um, discovered the digital twin concept? Yes. And and this is something that I promote and and I'm a big fan of just, you know, a certain type of data structure that now and it's very general. And you yeah. would, and I think you would still apply your your domain based on top of the digital twin, but it's for physical objects, you know, right. and and I think when we start if you're if you're online and you're creating value through bits like you do with Facebook and you do you know, with Google, then that's one thing. And you've got the data. But when you're in the physical world, it, it to me, it, it, it I think it, it just points to a need of having a different data structure that that kind of represents almost like a simulation. Yeah. Um, but not almost like a simulation that represents the physical world. And then and then you can then put the domain based, you know, bits on it. But but you still need an underlying structure. So so do you do you use the concept of digital twin or is it still something you're kind of grappling with? Um, I will say that we haven't necessarily gotten into the world where we're twinning with physical assets, although it was part of the original design. Um, I would like to think uh, like Amazon, uh, the tools that I've built have been envisioned to be a generic platform from the start. Uh, I just don't think that uh, in the modern world, you should think anything different uh, mm-hmm. of, of a way mm-hmm. to go about building a, a technology strategy. But having said all of that, um, we're still in a much more um, um, simplistic view of the world yeah. with our adopters, right? Um, there are definitely some that are doing um, that level of uh, thinking. And Hitachi comes to mind um, as a both IoT uh, technology provider and a you know, a diversified manufacturer with all sorts of capital goods Mm -hmm. um, in their portfolio. Digital twinning makes a lot of sense for them. Um, And where we have sort of begun to generate a market is a little bit down market, as I said, from there, more sort of facilities management, uh, broadly defined anywhere from office buildings to airports, um, where people are, yeah, they they actually are measuring physical objects, but they don't really think of them that way because they are the environment. people live in their their physical objects so big that people don't think of them as objects. Yeah, physical environments i mean yeah, environments kind of yeah that's yeah, right yeah. but i but I, my equivalent to the digital twin um in the way that we've designed this the system and, and the concept of data mart is i think to recognize that every piece of data every record 
has multiple stakeholders with moral or legal rights to control. Um, and I simply call those owners right, <laughs> right. Have to be a, a pin in that yep. you know, more, yep. more, okay, concept. Um, so we've built the annotation engine and um, a po- policy language that is aware that a particular piece of data has multiple owners and needs to respect the intent, the rights, the policies, the governance of all of those owners before it can be used to a purpose. Um, and in many ways, I think that is the digital equivalent of a, of a digital twin because the data you are generating uh, essentially is your avatar in the digital space. So um, if it also is kind of notionally owned by the physical object that derives it, I think that's a pretty natural extension right. of that. And I think the right. thing that's interesting about both of those, and you used the word earlier, which I thought was great, is temporal because the world doesn't stay static. Mm-hmm. Ship changes constantly. Uh, an example I use is, you know, a shopkeeper who puts up an IoT connected camera to keep track of security concerns in their shop. Well, at any point in time, there might be 10 consumers in frame of that camera. And by GDPR rules, every one of those consumers owns that frame of information from that camera. <laughs> at the 11th of the of the person who put the camera up. Um, so that requires a whole other level of sophistication. I think people are scratching their heads. Well, ultimately, I think, you know, uh, video- so you're saying explicitly separating the different faces from within one frame of a video. That's right. And, and before I could say, send that frame of video to a marketing partner who was interested in understanding the traffic patterns of my store, I better mm. go look at the policies of each one of these individuals and say, am I allowed to share this frame or not? And um, yeah, you know, maybe right. there's a 10th holdout who says, no, I, I want to remain um, completely anonymous. And so, the you know, eventually the camera systems and the data system need to be smart enough to edit the video to say, I'm only going to share those where everyone in frame has agreed uh, for one reason or another, whether it's to, you know, get some societal good or or maybe it's just ignorance. But I don't think that's going to exist in the world eventually. But, you know, (laughs) they'll get paid for it or, you know, they're. um, they're or they're sharing. obfuscated. I mean, they can also be taken out of the out of the frame, right? That's right. I mean, that that's something that's that you could that you could process. And so you kind of have: are they in? Are they in? Are they out? Yeah. Um, and if they're out, well, then either don't use the entire frame, or maybe just don't use them. I think that's right. Um, and you know, different types of data have different concerns relative to that. You know, so temperature data, right? All right. So the temperature of a space um, is that owned by all the individuals in that space? Eh, probably not. That, that might be a bridge too far for that mm. for the privacy end. But, um, you know, there are still areas where let's say we're recording ex- exterior temperatures um, by uh, our smart meters. And we've also got a weather prediction AI company that wants that temperature data. Um, whose data is that? Well, is it the utility company who deploys the um, the smart uh, meters, or is it the property upon which the smart meter was installed? It's temperature data. Most mm-hmm. most uh, uh, property owners might not be uptight to say, "Well, I don't want you to know that it was twenty five C in my uh, <laughs> at yeah. my house." Um, you know that might not uh, set off our our spider senses around uh, privacy violation, but it, it's still. Uh, contribution of information that needs to be respected. And so even in that more mundane um, situation, I would say that, you know, my intent as a homeowner might be different than my uh, my intent as a consumer in a, in a retail store, but I still have an intent. I still have a policy and um, it would still be important for people to respect that. And I think ideally respect it voluntarily rather than respect it because regulation has required it. Uh, because once regulation is written, it's really hard to unwrite. And I think that's the peril we're in, as you said, you know, older yeah. generation writing regulations based on our perspective. But, you know, it's going to be very hard for our children and our children's children to unravel those regulations once they're in place. So, you know, I really hope that, you know, 
these digital natives like Google and Facebook and Amazon, those those people who uh, are drawing the attention of regulators will voluntarily comply in a sophisticated enough way that we avoid you know, the creation of these reactionary and, and temporally sensible, but ultimately ridiculous laws that yeah. might come out of it. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because going back to last summer, what struck me and I, and I think I, for those who've been listening for a long time, I'm sure I brought it up on the podcast. I certainly wrote about it, but what struck me was the difference in mentality. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, everyone I'm not going to say bureaucratic, but their perspective was bureaucratic in the sense of innovation was secondary to regulation. Yeah. And in the U.S., it was the other way around. And I and I have to say, just, you know, I'm I'm, I'm North American, I'm Canadian, but I'm, you know, North American. And I lean toward that, you know, to that side. And it, it kind of bothered me to us to uh, to a certain extent because I just felt that. Yeah, that's not the way it should be, you know, that it shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't be in, the, but then, you know, as, as I thought it through a little bit more and you kind of touched on it, technology such as that technology to identify different, you know, people in within one frame can potentially, uh, can potentially solve these things. And so, you know, maybe in the end it is, you know, and this kind of maybe my worldview that technology can almost solve everything, which probably is wrong. My wife would definitely disagree with it, but, uh, maybe, you know, maybe it does spur, maybe it is kind of this, this, this pendulum, but it does spur this innovation in yeah. kind of these things that you're, you know, that you're mentioning of, of separating the, you know, the data, right. even within a frame. I think that's um, right. Before we go any further though, I think it's important that you explain to everyone the difference between your data mart and these data exchanges. Yeah. And because up to this point in the mini series, I've been speaking uh, to companies that have these outposts, you know, right. on the internet and people go to them, contrast what you guys are doing yeah. uh, with, with that. Well, uh, you know, and if we extend by analogy, I suppose it's the same way that, you know, brick and mortar or, or even e-commerce uh, developed on the internet is, you know, the first thing to pop up our special purpose marketplaces, right. Or, or stores. I think you'd even think of them mm -hmm. um, even more trivially, right. Mm -hmm. um, where it's a destination for a particular buyer for a particular product. Um, and I think that's the state of where data marketplaces are and have historically been, you know, there's been companies like Thomson Reuters and Bloomberg who have sold financial data True. Uh, to, uh, you know, financial consumers generally um, for, for, you know, a generation or two or so that, that, that model has been around for a while. And now we're seeing extended into other domains. Notably, I see automotive data being, a, a real hot space. But I think the natural evolution of that is for those products to want to broaden and the inventory of these marketplaces to expand. If there's a difference between what needs to happen with uh, data marts today and, you know, mart marts of the past, I think it's the velocity at which the uh, product space and the sensible controls need to evolve. It's got to be here pretty close to overnight if we're going to mm. head off this regulational problem and, and, <laughs> and frankly, respect people's rights the way we ought to be uh, across the world. So we've got to do it much faster. So what we were thinking about from a data mark perspective was building that platform that could allow you to host a petabyte of specific uh, domain scrubbed content the way I think you see most data marketplace uh, currently. Well, what they aspire to anyway. Or what they now. aspire to, correct. Um, mm -hmm. Down to, you know, Bruce offering his private uh, 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 browsing behaviors as a, mm -hmm. as a you know, Persona, equivalent of a yeah. digital mom and pop, right? Um, and everything in between. So where we started was not to say, this is a marketplace. So you come here, you put data to sell and you, and you go buy data. Um, what we're trying to do is take a, I hope pragmatic and maybe incremental approach to this to say, everybody should be able to set up their own uh, digital marketplace for data, but almost nobody realizes that they should, that they will want to, and that it's even possible. So where we've got to start is to say, look, um, you're deploying IoT today. Let's remove some of the friction of that uh, transaction by allowing you to store, annotate, retrieve, format that data in a way that makes it more useful to you 
Anyway, yeah. Anyway, exactly. Uh, first, primarily, uh, because everybody thinks about that first use case, right? And they want to see ROI, and they want to see, uh, they want to be comfortable with that first use case. But my experience is after that, after the comfort, after that ROI, and then they start saying, "Well, what else could I do with this?" Um, and often it's too late to think after the first if you didn't build with the uh, secondary use cases, tertiary use cases, um, at least in your realm of possibility. So. We're helping people deploy practical IoT solutions today. Under the covers is this sharing engine and this policy tool that will allow them to unlock and share the data that they're collecting. But, you know, in a lot of ways, we're focused primarily on just helping them get that initial deployment, get out of pilot hell. Structure. Structure, right? Established structure fundamental uh, problem, generate value on their own, because if they generate value from their data on their own, then it's a very natural thing to say, if I'm getting value from this data, who else would get value from that data? And I think that naturally leads you to think, "Hmm, since it is zero marginal cost and I can continue to use it for my purposes, maybe I could uh, help subsidize my expansion or just, you know, generate a uh, bottom line margin uh, mm-hmm. by mm-hmm. allowing other people to use this data for other, other reasons. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No. I, and you know, so, you know, what, what MicroShare is doing is allowing you to start your own data mart. That's and right. whereas before it was a destination, you know, in the previous episodes, it was a destination that, that I wanted to make sure that, you know, my listeners knew about and then, and because I think external data is super important. And yeah. so a destination, you know, but what you guys are doing is, is taking it even more fundamental and saying, well, okay, you can build your own data, data mart mm-hmm. and put it internally. And by the way, it's good for you. You know, that's, and right. that's kind of what, you know, it's good for you. You need this data governance, you need this structure anyway. And then if you choose to, you could open up, you could open up the, you could put a shingle on the outside and that's then, right. And sell things. So sell it, things it, and buy things, right? And it's, buy things. Yeah. Because I think, you know, real sophistication, well, I'll use a, a practical example um, in facilities management. You know, we're dealing with real estate operators and um, they vary in sophistication, as you might imagine. But all of them are looking to improve their operations, to, uh, you know, squeeze cost out, to find new ways to generate revenue because um, it's a capitally intensive operation. There's a lot of risks to it, even though it's been generally stable as, a, as an industry, you know, so people are deploying IOT in their office buildings, let's say, to understand occupancy patterns um, and instrumenting my building alone tells me one thing about that operation and then I can get value out of just understanding that occupancy, but it would be much more valuable if I can compare occupancy across all of my buildings. Now I can mm-hmm. see relative to my other properties, how's the occupancy status of this one downtown property, for instance, what does it tell me about the world? Well, now extend it out to say, what if I could get a view of comparison of my occupancy across all of my uh, neighbors, all of the other office buildings that are also measuring occupancy in the downtown area or maybe halfway across the world? What can I squeeze out in terms of best practice and operational efficiencies if now I can go buy data from other people, pay them for the use and uh, pay them less than it would, would grant to me with operational insights? Um, I think that's a very natural consumer aspect of what happens, particularly around analytics and machine learning is, gee, I'm learning so much about my stuff. What if I could just include a little bit of uh, somebody else's stuff? Mm -hmm. And hey, uh, with MicroShare, you kind of discover by the time it occurs to you to do that, that it's built for that uh, in the first place, that you can go discover other people's things and reflexively, obviously, um, uh, voluntarily contribute your uh, material to that market ta- place, uh, either for zero charge because there's a uh, societal good you want to you want to meet, and you see open data, uh, particularly in a smart city space where it has that sort of open source data gestalt to it, which is great. Or I have a a very high threshold to sharing. If somebody meets this price, then I'm willing to to uh, to share that data in these following conditions. Right. It's not a competitor. It's not in my market. It's, you know, X, Y, Z. So it can go. A marketplace can be everything from you can't buy anything that I have an inventory to 
everything there is free. And in the middle of I've got some policy to express and some terms and conditions that must be met before sharing uh, can be possible. And and that's what we've mm-hmm. built is that, you know, platform that that allows that breadth of um, of sharing uh, from fully commercialized to no commercialization and everything in between. Yeah. And, you know, I think you're you're kind of answering my next question. But I, I think the first point is it's not a zero sum gain with data. You know, right. it, if you bring different data together, so you're looking to for others, uh, other data. So you go when whether it's a data mart, an exchange, a marketplace, mm. you get that data, mm. but also making your data available. And like you said, it could be anywhere on the spectrum where nothing is available to everything is available. But I guess to put it in more concrete terms, you're putting a, I don't want to, I want you to actually answer this, mm. but what, why go through putting this extra, I mean, you could just have a very structure, a data, a database structure, a very architecture, a very right. uh, transparent internal database architecture within your company. Maybe it includes the digital twins. Eventually, maybe it will include the digital twins. Why should a company put this extra abstraction layer on top of their data to allow it to be, is it simply just for commerce or is there more are there other benefits uh yeah that, that you know because you could i mean what you're describing and what we're talking about is having good structure and good data hygiene right. and right. and policies but you could do this without the concept of a data mart so what is the Absolutely. data mart add is it this commerce a- aspect or is there more to it i think th- i think it's a great question I-, I think there is more to it and, and probably it's more kind of pragmatic today's problem benefits right that um Kind of as a technologist, as a futurist, I like to leap <laughs> to the, you know, 10 years from now, why does this change mm. the world? But in today's world, people have regulations that they need to address that aren't necessarily about selling data. They're about internal use as well. And GDPR is an example, right? So, okay. Um, okay. and in banking, uh, there are rules that say, uh, even in the US, that say uh, the data collected in financial operations cannot be used by the marketing operation. Well, if you yes. back up, that's a sharing transaction. It's an internal sharing transaction. It's between divisions of the same company. But our policy engine was developed so that it addresses that problem too. So yes. that the people who are requesting data uh, can only see data that they're allowed to see, even if that is sort of internal to a large organization or even within a family. Right. Uh, I may want to share data with uh, my spouse, but not with my children and vice versa. You know, yeah, I think in the microscopic and, and then into the, the macroscopic, you see those kind of uh, desires for um, some level of fungibility today, but certain controls that are mandated and um, certain controls that are practical, right? You don't want yeah. uh, necessarily any employee to be able to query uh, your corporate uh, knowledge store, I will call, um, mm-hmm. and, and see, you know, the gory details of, of how the uh, financial process is running, particularly if you are a, um, if you are a uh, public company, right? So yeah. I think there's yeah. all these practical concerns uh, that exist within organizations and within ecosystems, right? So... Um, um, uh, orchestrating supply chains is classic use case, right? Um, where you see things like RFID, which I think is, you know, probably the first generation of IoT uh, to get deployed in industry. Mm. Um, they were used to, you know, uh, manage, uh, theoretically optimize um, ecosystems where goods were being exchanged and, you know, complex goods manufactured from parts. And, you know, if you could, no, 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 no. no yeah, no, I, I hear where you're going with yeah. that, but I think, I think just to loop back, and I, I think with, with supply chain, <clears throat> you could, you could get around the issue, but, yeah. but I think the fundamental issue that you're talking about are these policies, right. and, and I think that's a, an important added value. Right. You know, I like to say that that cybersecurity is to protect your data from outside bad actors. Right. And policies, internal policies, privacy policies, uh, different types of policies are protect your data from internal bad actors like marketing guys like I used to be. And what you're doing, what you're talking about here is this institutionalization of policy. And I think, you know, whether you apply that to supply chain, whether you apply that to whatever business, that's also very key for everyone to think about is, and again, here we are, GDPR, but that's the reality is that when, when we live in a GDPR world and assuming 
you know, that that you will sell in some capacity outside of the, let's say, the United States. So if you sell to a, an EU citizen, right. you're part of it, whether you like it or not. That's right. And so this institutionalization of policy, super important. And so that right. that is another benefit, I think, um, you know, that that I just want to, again, underline that you brought up that in addition to the commerce side of things, which I think is an added benefit and mm-hmm. looking down, looking like you said, kind of looking 10 years down the road. Yeah, that could end up maybe one year, maybe 10 year, whatever that could end up being very valuable uh, to the, the value of your company. That's right. But also just just pragmatically just looking at institutionalizing policy and and what you're and I think what you're saying is that and I don't know how granular maybe you can you can explain this, but. You know, you can take it down to, a, you know, a data set, a, a data right. record. I mean, and then yeah. so do you have policies that are kind of how 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 finite are these policies or how, um, you know, how detailed are they? Yeah, they're they're, they're actually quite granular and, and maybe more granular than they need to be. Uh, you know, the balance is always um, granularity with, um, manageability, right? Um, Mm -hmm. what we built was a system that could be as granular, you know, down to the row and column level, um, of data, because I think, you know, a very common use case is I'm willing to share some of this data, but not all of it. Uh, I I will, I will share the temperature that I'm reading, but not whether or not I'm home, um, in my smart home uh, scenario, even though it's detected by the same sensor and possibly mm-hmm. stored in the same message coming from that device, um, I, I think differently, or I will think differently about different levels um, uh, of context. Uh, so um, we wanted to be able to produce something that allows tremendous sophistication. I think that what we'll see are industry groups and advocacy groups on the consumer side that come up with um, sophisticated kind of branded policy sets that people can adopt um, rather than, mm-hmm. you know, every individual will have to figure it all out for themselves. Right. Yeah, at, at I agree. So I think, yeah. I think I think there will be a uh, some bodies that will step in to help uh, reduce rules the to abide by uh, exactly you know, self self governing that's rules right to and, and, and I and I might feel like I want the LL Bean uh, model of, uh, of of data governance <laughs> to to sure. apply to 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 me and mine um, so I, I also think it will have some aspect of branding like uh, I trust this organization to be watching out for me. Um, <laughs> But uh, it goes quite granular because uh, because, yeah, the the situation could be at the data set level. But because of the temporal nature of shifting um, Mm. senses of, you know, things that move around the world and um, just in time partnering and uh, digital goods you're measuring that are bought by one party and then sold to another keeping track of the rights of those individuals as they move through time, um, the jurisdictions of regulation as things move through space, Mm -hmm. uh, that, that needs something quite sophisticated. Um, and, but I think really importantly and practically for today, it doesn't force you to understand and have thought all of that through before you start. Uh, because I think that's, you know, kind of the part of the agile mindset we're trying to bring to the marketplace is to say, look, one day you're going to need tremendous sophistication. I know that's scary. I know you really haven't thought too deeply about it, mm-hmm. but let's get started today. Um, let's address this use case. Let's address whatever uh, regulatory or privacy or, you know, practical policy considerations mm-hmm. you have today. But just know that there is more sophistication mm-hmm. as you need it. You're not going to need to replatform, copy data, you know, rethink your deployment. You know, it's 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 a bedrock built to grow with you and adapt to the world as it changes. And I, I don't, I don't know uh, a, a more important thing to do with a, with a bedrock platform like data management than, than to be that. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. And I, and I agree with that. And, and I think, yeah, you can take it to whatever. I mean, I think there's going to be a slight amount of overhead to be able to structure and yep. maybe, you know, put the data in, but it gives you infinitely more um, flexibility, That's right. potentially infinitely more flexibility That's for right. the future. And I think it's just the way things are going anyway. Yeah. I mean, this goes back to just the data literacy. I mean, this is just another level of data literacy, not just, but this is another level of data literacy mm. that we all got to get our head around, right. you know, one way or the other. Um, well, Tim, if uh, uh, 
people want to actually maybe open up their own data part and uh, maybe you can let everyone know how they can find out more about yourself and, and more about, uh, about your organization. Yeah. I think the easiest way is to go to microshare.io um, and um, all uh, uh, data is available there. We've got um, a couple of blogs and um, we're pretty, um, pretty prolific with write, white papers about, um, you know, writing about these concepts. If you want to learn more about the way we think about that problem or the way we think you should think about it, um, there's a, a, a lot of information there. And um, obviously, if we can help you commercially, uh, we'd love to do that. Excellent. No, and, and we'll put that in the show analysis notes. We'll also put uh, the white paper, uh, your white paper uh, that we read and anything else you want to send me, uh, we'll put in the show analysis notes. But with that, um, Tim, excellent. I uh, had, a, had a good uh, time talking and uh, we'll talk soon. Fascinating conversation. Thank you, Bruce. Okay. That was a good talk with Tim Panagus. This podcast goes vertical deep diving into different topics each week. If you prefer a more horizontal and structured approach to learning IoT business and its orbiting technologies, check out my book IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, or become a certified IoT professional by completing the ICIP training and certification program. For details, just go to www.iot-inc.com. Also go to www.iot-inc.com for an analysis of this episode, links to things that were mentioned during the episode, and very importantly, the episode's PDF transcript. Just search for the name of the episode or the guest. If you're new to this podcast, subscribe. That way you'll get every week's episode delivered straight to your device. Or if you've been listening for a while, there are three ways you can support the show. You can leave a rating or a review on iTunes. Just go to iot-inc.com slash iTunes. It only takes one click to leave a rating, a little bit longer to leave a review. You can share it on social. I'm on LinkedIn, to a lesser extent, on Twitter. And of course, you can support this show by buying my book, IoT Inc., or the ICIP Training and Certification Program. That's how I pay the bills. Next week's episode is The Full Array of Big Data Applied to IoT with Mark Van Ramenem of Dataflock. I hope you can join me then. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair. Thank you for listening. Till next week, may your path to IoT business be a data-driven one. You have been listening to the IoT Inc. Business Show. 